so uh, yeah, I actually, I come from product design and complexity design, and we wrote a book. Uh, I ran a lab that came out of Carnegie Mellon about uh, 30 years ago um, that is now a part of BCGX, that is part of their deep tech and the human-centered design part of, of BCGX. But um, our book was called Trillions, and it was about what happens when we have trillions of computational devices. We live in a sea of information. Um, and, and it was, it was uh, a way of us thinking about things that at the time, people kind of laughed at us. We're not going to have trillions of computational devices. But we said, well, what if you did? What if you had lots of things? We now make more transistors than grains of rice, and we make them cheaper. And what would a trillion look like? And we don't really understand how to do that. But one chapter in the book was about biomimicry for information systems. And it was about how might we learn? When you want to do something really hard, learn from somebody else who's already done something hard. And nature is showing off every day. How many cells do you think you have in your body? How many cells, approximately? Yeah, two billion, two billion. Two billion. Who, who's got a different number? How many? 30 trillion. How many? 100 billion. Oh, it's a small number. OK. So, so somewhere between, at this moment, somewhere between 50 and 100 trillion cells in our body, we're a complex information system. We don't reboot every month. Um, we'll go like 80, 90, 100 years without a catastrophic failure. We're mostly bottom-up, peer-to-peer. Every single cell in our body, except for mature red blood cells, have a spare copy of us in the form of DNA. If we cut our leg, it doesn't call the cloud to fix it. It calls all the buddies around it, and it starts repairing it, and then there's a layer of complexity on it called endocrine system, or the circulatory system, or the nervous system. We have layered semantics. It's a really exciting space. And so in Trillions, we were using... Uh, the idea of biology for information systems, biomimicry, as a metaphor. So I was invited to Autodesk, and they asked me to come, because we don't have any uh, computer-aided design tools, they're right across the street that way and over that way, um, that actually look at what happens if products and places wake up. If suddenly we go from de dead products that we ship and we don't know anything about, to being able to do sort of population health across, across a whole fleet of digital awake products that have computation on the edges. So I joined the office of the CTO, and, um, and the head of strategy said, you know, there's somebody you need to talk to. His name is Andrew Hessel. And Andrew Hessel is going to talk a little later. And Andrew says to me, I, I say, well, what are you doing in the office of the CTO? And he goes, oh, I'm at a bio lab right there at Pier 9, and we're booting up viruses to actually cure cancer. And I was like, wait, 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 wait. Why is a computer-aided design company working on this? And he's like, well, it turns out that a virus is like a thumb drive. And it plugs into your cell, and it can, it's like 50 kilobits. So it's smaller than a, an, a blank Word document. And it plugs into your cell, and it convinces your cell to make stuff. It runs an app on your, on your cell. And, and, and it was like, wait, what are you talking about, Andrew? <laughs> and then he introduced me to this thing called synthetic biology. And it's very different than uh, if you've heard about Genentech and the sort of the wave, the Asilomar conference in the 70s and what led to sort of biotech. In this case, it was people at MIT, people at, at Berkeley and others who were basically saying, could we actually look at the cell like it was a programmable circuit board? Could you go to Radio Shack and get a bunch of parts like a solar panel and, and a switch and a display surface, but could you find them inside of E. coli? And could you like connect them up? And, and some of these folks started doing that. They started seeing that you could get a kit of parts like Radio Shack and you could connect them. And suddenly you could turn something on. And so one of the student teams that was competing in this global Olympics called iGEM at MIT, they said, what if we could take the smell, which is like a display surface for us, we can smell things. What if we could take the smell of bananas and take the gene that causes the protein that makes that smell and put it in E. coli, a, a bacteria that kind of smells like poop most of the time. Um, and then what if we could connect it, connect maybe another gene that makes the smell of mint? And what if we could put that in there? And then what if we could find a switch, like an on-off switch? Maybe when it's growing and eating the agar, eating the food, it's switched one way, but when it's ready to harvest, it's switched another. They called it E. de E. coli. And, and it started smelling like bananas until it was ready to be harvested, then it smelled like, like mint. And suddenly they had built a, a biological circuit. So that's what synthetic biology is. It's really interesting and it's harnessing the wonders of the planet. So now I'm a visiting scholar at Tufts in bioengineering because I'm interested in how we might 
co-create with nature to actually build our planet or grow our world in the physical space rather than necessarily manufacturing it out of forever chemicals? How might we enlist and kind of play with nature? Because nature's showing off every day. Thank you.